morning and thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday morning. Um, I'm not sure about you, but it was sunny when I got up this morning and now it's clouded over. So hopefully it's still sunny where you are. Um, while we wait for everyone, we've got quite a few people with us, which is incredible. Obviously, if we were in a face to face format, you would be able to meet each other, network. Um, so we don't want you to miss out. Feel free to pop in the chat function, introduce yourself, say hello. Tell us a bit about your business. Feel free to pop your contact details in there. Just make sure that when you're sending it, you send it to all panelists and all attendees. And then it means that everyone can see and read um, what you're putting in the chat function. So we'll just give it a minute um, more before we get started. But yeah, feel free to pop in the chat function, say hello, introduce yourself. Let us know if you've been to, if you went to a restaurant yesterday or the cinema or a gym class, how did you feel? Are you still apprehensive about it? Um, it'll be great to hear your um, views and what you think. So Neil, what did you get up to at the weekend? Uh, did a fair bit of work actually. Uh, and then some gardening on Sunday, but it was a bit chilly, wasn't it? It was. I kept having to, I did gardening on Sunday as well, but I kept having to like come in and out where the short shop showers came down. Um, but it was great for the gardening. I just thought the plants will love all of this um, rainwater. Especially considering how dry it had been in April. April was a disaster. So, you know, we're sort of swamped, aren't we? I know. I almost feel like the seasons have pushed back a month. So we're getting the April showers now in May. Um, and like I remember last year, I'm sure September and October were quite warm for mm. the time of year. It just feels like there's like a month shift backwards. Yes. Everything's behind, doesn't it? Yes. So uh, morning, Joe. She's um, I said Joe. Sorry. Morning, John. I only saw the first part. Apologies. Um, morning, John. He's put his um, linked in. Um, contact details. So I think we'll get started um, and then what I'll do is afterwards I'll turn my video off and chase the people that haven't joined us so far. So thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kayleen Harrington and I'm the event manager for Norfolk Chambers of Commerce. So before we get started, I wanted to let you know that the B2B exhibition will hopefully be taking place on Thursday, the 14th of October. The B2B exhibition is Norfolk's largest business to business exhibition, free to attend and attracting hundreds of businesses on the day. B2B is a highlight on the Norfolk events calendar. I'll pop a link to the event page in the chat shortly. So top tips for growing a business that cost nothing. There are three core strategies at the heart of what every business should be doing. However, most will only do one at best and ignore the rest. And typically the only one they tackle is generating new leads the hardest and most expensive strategy of the three. In this 60 minute webinar, Neil Foley, founder of Business Growth Club, will explain the three core strategies behind the Business Growth Club and will explore and explain all eight of their business boosters that can be used together to make a great difference for your business. Following the presentation, there'll be a live Q&A where Neil will answer all of your questions. So please use the Q&A function when you have a question. This webinar is being recorded, so we'll share that with you following the event. And I'll also share with you um, a copy of the presentation as well. So Neil, over to you. All right, let me just share my screen then. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for giving me uh, everybody uh, our, your time. What we're going to do is explore over the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so is some of the key principles behind the Business Growth Club, which is something that I founded uh, quite a few years ago. 
as Kaylin said, you'll have a copy of the presentation if you want. But actually, more importantly, there are 19 workbooks which accompany the Business Growth Club, which are available for you free of charge. Uh, I'll show you how to access them later on. So everything we're talking about will actually have some form of workbook that you can work through, which will explain it in more detail. So I think I would use the time today just to go to make notes, think about things that as they come through your mind, because as I say, you'll have the workbooks uh, ultimately, which will help. And the guiding principle that we're talking about is that actually there are some, we can approach business growth in a slightly more scientific way rather than just a bit of potluck and a bit of you know, trial and error. What we're going to do is go through the three business multipliers to support that are what I call the eight business boosters. And in essence, what we're trying to do is to look at what experience has taught me uh, throughout a lifetime in business and probably the last 25, 30 years running my own show and helping goodness knows how many other small business owners. I mean, I like to say that there is only really one advantage to getting old and that is you just get a chance to experience more stuff. Uh, now that could be, you know, the, the opportunity to make the same mistakes with ever increasing confidence, or it could actually be just if you're always trying to learn and do things slightly better and talk to more people, uh, the, the reality is you just know more stuff. And that's what I would say is from my own viewpoint is the only advantage that I can see of getting old. And I think when I talk about things being slightly more about trying to use a science, if you like, if you think of a typical small business problem where accounting or bookkeeping would be one, you know, the solution wouldn't be that you just muddle through. You, you outsource what you can't do. You give it to a bookkeeper or accountant, or at the very least, even if you don't do that, you use an accounting system. You know, it's, you know, QuickBooks and Sage and Xero and Cashflow and all these people uh, all advertise very heavily. So people just say, use the system. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Same with the law. If you weren't an expert on the law, uh, be that from the HR through to contracts, etc. You don't just have a stab yourself. You know, you have you you either use a uh, a local lawyer or HR firm that can help you, or you use a template system. Not the Chamber of Commerce has one, but you use a template system. Same with IT. You wouldn't just muddle through. Again, you would use a local firm, or you'd use an operating system. And yet, in some ways, when we talk about sales and marketing, that very rarely happens. So people think about it last minute, they'll, they'll get by, you know, they'll write some copy at the last minute and struggle with it. Or the, the real cracker is they'll get a website. Uh, let's get a nice looking website, but actually no idea what to write on it. So what we'll do is we'll copy everybody else. Uh, and then sadly that doesn't work very well. So what I mean by the three business boosters is this is the system that every business should be looking at. Uh, and the three business multipliers, rather. The first one is lead generation. Uh, as Kayleen said at the beginning, that's what most people understand. There's, you know, there's nothing too much uh, controversial about lead generation. It isn't easy to do, uh, but you know we understand the basic principles behind it. But the second business multiplier is sales conversion. Now, suddenly, we're in a scenario where actually few businesses do this well. Few businesses even think about it. They often get the lead generation sales convert, uh, sales conversion combined and a bit confused. And the third bit is actually, what do you do with your existing people, your existing customers and clients? Uh, and businesses can be very poor at number two and three. Uh, and we can all think of, I'm sure, big businesses who in particular are lousy at number three. They spend all their time trying to attract new customers, ignoring the fact that you know, the funnel's empty the funnel is emptying at the bottom and people are just drifting away. And if we think about it, the three business multipliers, uh, if lead generation is the one that most people do, then you're only firing on one of the three cylinders. Uh, and ironically, it's the most expensive one. It's the hardest one to do, arguably. It's the most expensive one. And why I call it a multiplier is if you spend a bit of time on all three of the multipliers and get them right. You get the multiplying effect, you know, in a very crude analogy, you know, 10 plus 10 plus 10 is 30, but 10 times 10 times 10 is a thousand. So if you just can tweak some of the things in the sales processes and then looking after existing customers, 
imagine the difference it makes. It makes a significant difference uh, straight away. So that's the principle behind the growth club and the principle and the, the experience that I've learned and all the workbooks talk about this so you can access all of this. But let's go through it in a little bit more detail to try and help people differentiate what I mean by lead generation and then sales conversion. So lead generation is literally just getting somebody to show interest. And the great analogy that I, I, I find helpful for me is think of yourself as a department store. The reason for using this is we all know what a department store is uh, while they're still around. Uh, and the department store is we're walking past on the pavement. We've got prospects walking past all the time. What is it that's going to make them stop and want to go in? Now you have uh, people who dress windows, you have advertising, which will in, in, try and entice people in. So this, all, we're, all we're trying to do with lead generation is get people to say, I want them to get inside the shop. That's all we want them to do. What is it going to make them stop on the pavement and think, you know what, I'll go and spend a bit of time in there. And this works on a digital analogy or the physical analogy. There's, there's, there's no difference. And the key thing to ask yourself in terms of this is how people can get confused with lead generation is, well, what if you had to buy something before you went in the shop? What if the shop owner was, you know, you imagine some of the small shops that we've probably been in at times where the shop owner, you can see in the shop just behind the door, lurking away, bored, rocking on their heels, uh, hoping that you're going to come in and buy something. Are you going to come in and browse, have a look around, kick the tyres, just pick things up, have a look? Uh, you're not going to do it. Uh, and, and why would you? Because it's, you know, I don't want to buy anything. I just might be interested. And that's the key to it. And that's how we need to think of lead generation is we need to entice people enough so that they come inside our digital space or our physical space uh, and gives us a chance to demonstrate expertise. So, Lead generation, nothing more. So it's not selling to them. It's nothing more than getting them in through the front door. And then we need a different strategy and it's a different message. Uh, and now we need some way of actually processing it and having a, a process and a system, which means that we can sell to them. And the key one here, in particular for small firms that most of us will be, is if you haven't got a process then to a large extent, the sales conversion can depend on who answers the phone, who's in the office at that particular time, who gets the email, who gets the web inquiry. And some of us are going to be better at this than others. So if you haven't got a process, you're relying on somebody's personality, skill set, how busy they are, how stressed they are today, as to how good they actually manage the sale. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. In particular, when you think the lead generation, which is the expensive bit, has cost you money to get somebody in. Invariably, it's cost you money. Uh, it's certainly cost you time. And here you are saying, well, how do you maximize the sales opportunity once people are inside? And so you need some sort of process and system to do that, which is what we talk about. And we've got the workbook to do that. And we'll talk about some of the key things you need to have to highlight that. But the third business multiplier is customer maximization. Stats would tell you it's five to eight times cheaper uh, to sell to somebody who's bought from you before. It's quicker. They'll, if you do it right, they end up buying more often and actually spend more with you uh, as well. So they buy bigger ticket items or they spend, they buy more tickets. Uh, and they stay loyal and they can become great advocates for you. Now, we, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we're, we're largely small businesses. Now, this is where we have an advantage over the big boys and the big businesses. Big businesses are lousy at customer maximization. They have a deeply cynical approach to it and they spend all their time uh, looking for new customers. You see that with financial institutions and banks with you know, different deals for new customers rather than looking after their very loyal customers who've been with them for years. You see it with insurance companies. There are state, you see it with mobile phone companies, you see it with all sorts of people. So we have an opportunity to really look after our existing customers. And ultimately, this is how you build value in your business. I've been involved in, uh, you sold the business and involved in uh, helping people buy businesses. And one of the things you're always looking for is the assets of the business, that nearly always not the physical assets. 
the physical assets that might be showing on your balance sheet, but actually they're probably worthless. Uh, the reality, you know, old stock and stuff like that actually hasn't got much value at all. The real value is, well, what are your existing customers like? Not have you gotten tied into a contract because people can break contracts uh, at the end of the day, but you know, how often do they stay with you? How long do they stay with you? What do they buy? How often do you come back? Do they come back to you? What's your relationship like with your existing customers? That's where the real value comes in. So let's look at some of the business boosters that you can actually use, which will help you with all three of those business multipliers we've talked about. Uh, there's nothing groundbreaking here. This isn't stuff that I've invented or anything else. This is taking uh, stuff that's been around for donkey's years, but we forget. And what we've tried to do is put them in a format that just makes perfect sense. So the most important one, is the headline and these aren't necessarily in order apart from the first business booster and the, and the last so the most important one is the headline and we'll go through the why in a minute you then need to talk about the benefits of your product or service by the way this applies to uh, whether you're in the service sector or manufacturing or production or it doesn't matter what you're in uh, these all apply you need to talk about your unique perceived benefit not usp uh, we'll come on to why it's not a USP in, in a short while. In particular, small businesses, we need to talk about guarantees and risk reversal. We need to be able to back that up with some form of reason why uh, us offers. And we need to create irresistible offers. And I don't mean giving money away or giving discounts. There's no point doing that. Uh, social proof is massive. And we've got some ideas as to how you could do that. And finally, the last one, which actually is in order of priority, so they've got the first and the last one, is, is you need a call to action. You need people to do stuff because invariably, very few of us are probably selling something that people desperately need today. If I've got a flat tire, I've got to go for, get it fixed. If uh, you know, I've got a broken windscreen, something's broken in, in, in the house, I've got, I've got to get it fixed today. But for most of us, we're not in that scenario. Tomorrow, tomorrow will do, and that's a big enemy. Uh, so we need a way of actually getting over that hump. So let's look at the importance of a headline. And the headline only has one purpose, and that's to get, grab your attention and get you to read the next line. That's all it is. Uh, and this is true whether it's uh, an email, uh, your website, a brochure, uh, a leaflet, doesn't matter what it is. You've got to get people to stop and think, oh, and, and get them to think, that's talking to me. That's a problem that I've actually had or a problem that I've actually got. Uh, and yet you wouldn't believe people understand this. And it's common sense. There's nothing unusual here. Most of the time in marketing that you see, a lot of it is about them. Uh, it's about the person doing the advertising or the person doing the promotion. It's very rarely about... Uh, about the, the prospect and you know you see emails saying you know I hope you're well and you're thinking I don't even know these people uh, so why and, and they're not interested so it's just silly so again the whole purpose of a headline is to grab your attention and make you think I need to read the next line I need to read the next paragraph I need to go a bit further uh, into this this could be of interest and worth my time so you need to understand your target market. So, so what do they want to see and hear? Quite often you'll see visuals, for instance, which act as a headline, so they grab you in. Saw a great one uh, a few weeks back for equity release. Equity release is a product that's probably aimed at the over 65s, so maybe be slightly older than that. And they had this you know, nice smiling couple who were in their 30s. And you're thinking, just as a stock image, somebody, because it's you know, photogenic. But actually, your target audience isn't going to look at that and relate to it. The target audience is going to look at it and think you're bonkers. So you need to be thinking about your target market. What is it they want to see and hear? What's actually going to resonate with them? What's going to make them think, actually, you understand who I am and what I am? And use language that they relate to. The simpler the language, the more powerful it is. And so you don't see that very often in headlines. But you need something to grab people's attention. This is the bit they're walking on the pavement. How do you get them inside? You've got to get something that makes them think, oh, you know what? Actually, I might be interested in that. I'll go into the department store. I'll read the next line. I'll click through into the website. I'll read the brochure on both sides, etc. 
Okay. And then what we then need to do is start talking about benefits. And we need to recognize that people buy with head and heart. Uh, people don't just purely buy on logic uh, and they don't really just buy on emotion either. You might have the initial attraction of buying on emotion, but then you need some logic to back it up. So you need both uh, at the end of the day. So features, which is what most people use when they're describing their product or service, uh, is appealing to the head, which is fine, but on their own, they're not powerful enough because they tend to talk about you know, the, the, the product rather than what the product can do for you, which is actually, when you think about it, all we're really interested in is, you know, what can the product do for, for, for me? What problem is it going to solve? So you need to use both. Uh, and there's a really easy way of doing it. You just add three words uh, to any feature that you're describing, and you just say, which means that. And you do that to every single feature with the most important first. So don't leave your biggest benefit for your particular product or service right to the end thinking you're going to blow them out of the water at the end so this is my you know i'm going to suddenly reveal my trump card right at the end there's no logic to doing that because quite often what will have happened is people won't have got to the end because they'll have got bored and thought actually you know what this isn't for me uh, so therefore i won't read it see it watch it etc so I'm, I'm off so it's very easy as i say to create benefits very few businesses do it uh, and uh, to their cost because once you realize how easy it is and you might have different benefits for different target markets in fact that would be entirely logical uh, and reasonable so you probably haven't got one you've probably got uh, a number of target markets you don't want too many because you don't want to try and appeal to everybody but to appeal to those that are going to be profitable for you that uh, make sense that are viable for you, that you can access. Target marketing is a workbook all on its own. But then once you've got your particular target market, just work through the benefits. And that leads on to our, our next business booster, which is unique perceived benefit. Uh, notice I've not said unique selling point, uh, because I, I can't see how you can possibly have a unique selling point. You're unique, absolutely right. But you can't have a unique selling point itself. People always talk about USPs. Uh, and if you've got one, you won't have one for very long because somebody's going to copy it. So rather than focus on a USP, uh, what you can do, however, quite easily, is if you take time and effort to explain all the benefits, you can appear unique because almost nobody else does this. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, marketing expertise that you can find that'll, that'll back this up, that actually you've got companies that stole a march, largely because they started to articulate the benefits, which is what made them look different. Actually, they're no different than everybody else, but actually they can appear different because of the language they use, because of the benefits that they talk about. So we've had benefits, we've had unique perceived benefit, uh, and then we go on to one of the real biggies, if you like, which is the guarantees and risk reversals this is you know especially true for small firms uh, in the b2b market as well as b2c and potentially you could argue in the b2b it's even it's even bigger uh, if you like because i mean if we're dealing with a small firm so it's, if you're dealing with bt for instance because you need some telecoms or whatever you have an expectation of what bt is it's probably not going to be great uh, but you know if I'm an employee and I'm in charge of doing something on the uh, telecoms front, I'm not going to get sacked for using BT. I'm not going to get criticised for it. And that, that brings us to something that I call the Saatchi and Saatchi mode. I was working with a company in uh, London who were a great uh, advertising agency. They were really very good. Did lots of, you know, won lots of awards, did some, got some great returns for clients. Uh, and as they got bigger, they started to come up against Saatchi and Saatchi. Uh, and they lost every time. Uh, not because Saatchi and Saatchi were tremendous or great. I mean, they're a good firm, obviously. Uh, but because nobody ever got sacked or got into trouble for choosing Saatchi and Saatchi. Whereas this other company that people have probably never heard of, even though they had a good background history to them, uh, the risk was too great. 
So you need to be very mindful of this Saatchi and Saatchi stuff. Uh, and the only way you can really tackle it is head on. It's by acknowledging the people to say, you know, we're a small firm. Uh, we, you know, small enough to care, but big enough to cope. So it's, you need to have some sort of analogy. So don't just assume that because your offering looks great and the rest of it, that's enough. Tackle this head on, because this, this is the unspoken objection in people's minds. And they're the ones that you need to anticipate. So how would you do it? How would you create a guarantee? Because you're not talking about giving money back willy-nilly. Really what you're saying is, no, let me just show you what we're like. So one of the key things you could do is to say, well, what do you do if something goes wrong? What do you do at the moment if something goes wrong? And of course, most small businesses bend over backwards to help. If something's gone wrong, cracky, or you're mortified, that's the last thing you want. So why don't you just explain that up front? Why don't you just say to people, look, sometimes things don't quite go according to plan because of technology, because of human beings, because of logistics. So when that happens, this is what we'll do. You know, you'll have my mobile number as the director and owner of the business. I'll bend over backwards to do everything possible. Do you have a returns or a refund policy? Just be honest and transparent. And what you are seeing more and more of this is companies that actually recognise that guarantees are really important. So, you know, under the Distance Selling Act, I think you've got 14 day notice period, 14 days to return a product or a service that actually isn't, hasn't met your expectations. It doesn't have to be a faulty product, you just say, actually, I've just changed my mind. One of the problems with a very short guarantee is what happens is you just focus on the short guarantee. You think, oh, you've only got you know, 14 days to change my mind on this. I've only got 28 days or whatever it is. So it's in the front of your mind. And then you're thinking in buyer's remorse is something we'll talk about a bit later on. But so we all have buyer's remorse. You're thinking, oh, have I made the right decision? So you do see some really smart companies around. And one I really uh, rate highly is one called Spoke, Spoke Trousers. They sell trousers in London. They build them in Europe. They have numerous sizes, etc. Good company. They have a 200 days return policy. And they also go the step further to say, wash them. So it's not, you know, return them in an unused condition in the original packaging with a receipt and we, we'll give you the money back. They say, no, we think our trousers are fantastic. So what I want you to do is try them, wear them, wash them. So you think you've got 200 days at any, any point in that 200 days you want to change your mind, just send them back, we'll give you your money back. What that does is demonstrate massive confidence in their product. They will have one or two people who will abuse it, uh, I'm sure. But for every one or two person, people who abuse it, there'll be a hundred people who say, you know what, this sounds like the sort of product for me. This sounds like the sort of company that is confident in its product of really good value. So therefore, uh, I'll give it a go. And then, of course, because it's 200 days, you forget all about it. So guarantees, just tackle them head on. But then you need to go on to something else, which you need to back up your claims. Because otherwise, what could happen is people would say, well, you, you, you would say that, wouldn't you? So it can be too good to be true. So you need to back up your claims. And indeed, you need to be doing this throughout your marketing with reasons why, as I call it. So it's not saying that you're passionate about your product or service, because everybody says that and it sounds very trite and hardly believable. And who cares? In fact, you're passionate about it. What difference does that make to me? What I need to know is, you know, what's your experience to date? So if you're the trouser company, where did you, you know, how did you start in the trouser business? What sort of knowledge have you got? How many trousers have you sold? Uh, and the numbers, actually, they did publish them on some of their advertising, uh, were huge. And again, you think, wow, right. you could you could publish the number of returns you've had. So you know, we have a 200-day return policy, and you know, 0.3% have been returned, and we refunded the money. But that meant you know, 90 odd percent of people were entirely happy. So you could talk about the the, the, the skills, how many. If, if, whatever sector you're, you're in, what have you provided, how many customers have you had to date, what reviews have you got supporting your claim. I remember seeing a very interesting, there's a very interesting travel company called Original Travel. They have, they still do brochures, uh, which they send through the post, so hard copy, because they know that that gets read. And one of the stats in there they had, it said at the, at the point of going to press, they had supported the itinerary and created the itinerary and holidays, it was for 43,200 43, and something odd people, no two one of which were the same because they do bespoke holidays. And that's such a powerful claim because you, again, you then think to yourself, well, I'm in the hands of people who know what they're doing. 
which is what I want. Uh, and so reasons why, really important, and that can be whether you're in the service sector, whether you're a plumber, if you're a plumber, you know, how many boilers have you installed? Well, you know, 203 or whatever it is, then the reality is what that means is that there isn't any scenario that I haven't covered. And I would be specific on the numbers and the jobs. Uh, I think when people say round numbers, you know, I've dealt with 100 people or whatever, actually what that means is you made the number up. Uh, so don't make the numbers up. Spend a bit of time, work out what your real numbers actually are. One of the other business boosters we talk about is irresistible offers. So there's, there's two forms of offers. You can have soft offers and, and uh, hard offers. Soft offers are where there's no direct interaction. So I'm going to speak to somebody well, normally in exchange for my email address and possibly a phone number. What I do is uh, I get uh, uh, some information from you. So be it a workbook, be it uh, how to do something or top guide or top tips. And offers are huge. So I'm not talking about money off or giving people a coupon. You might do that, but I, I, I only if they're going to buy big, big numbers. But otherwise, this is your opportunity to demonstrate expertise. And there is, there is, without a shadow of a doubt, you should be giving away information. You should be as generous as you possibly can. Because actually, just about everything's on the net anyway. Uh, but what it does is show confidence. And the more that you can give people information as to how good you are, uh, and how much, how in depth your knowledge is, the more likely they are to use you. So use whatever of the hard or soft offers, but you need to be giving away information. The temptation can be to think, well, I need to guard all this, I need to hold all this in because this is my intellectual property. Actually, it's all about well, online, as I said, uh, it can be found if you can dig around. But the more you demonstrate expertise, the more likely as people think, you know what, I can't do this, in which case I need somebody to do it for me well. Actually, you'd be a great person to choose. Social proof is, is you know, the who's had this before, before me question that we're all going to ask. If you think of how you shop on Amazon, you don't, you know, you've never put a product into Amazon where only one product comes up. Well, that's partly Amazon's algorithm, but it never, it's never just one. There's a choice. And what you do is you look at reviews. So if somebody's got, you know, five reviews and they're three stars, or even if they're five reviews, but they're all five stars, you think, hmm. Maybe, but maybe that's their mum and their friends or they've just manipulated it. But if they've got 300 reviews or, you know, or even more than that, and there's a mixture, that gives you some confidence. And then what you might do is look at some of the questions that people ask to say, actually, you know, especially if it's a bit of tech that uh, I buy and I'm thinking, I'm sure I understand it. Questions can be really powerful. So, so you know, reviews and testimonials and everything else are hugely important. And yet, we don't tend to find that we're uh, spending enough time creating these. Or if people have got Google reviews, they're not always responded to. And there's nothing worse uh, than seeing a Google review. Even if it's a really good one, people quite often as businesses respond to those and say, thanks very much, Neil, and glad you had a nice time, whatever it is. But then you, when you get a really poor review, which might be totally, completely and utterly unfair, uh, quite often the business owner or the businesses don't respond. And that just looks awful uh, because, again, you know, we've all got a choice. There's nothing unique about any of us. So if, if you start digging around, you're going to you're starting to form an opinion. So even if the business owner argues on the review and says, actually, uh, our take on this is fundamentally different than yours, that's fine. Uh, at least you, you can think, OK, maybe they maybe they were right. And to a large extent, we're getting more cynical, aren't we? Quite rightly so on reviews because they are manipulated uh, harder to do on trustpilot and some of the fifo and some of the others but you know google reviews can be manipulated some of the amazon reviews have been manipulated and what that means is we just need bigger numbers uh, because social proof is massive case studies are really important again all from your target market uh, they need to be uh, uh, from your target market talking to your target market Call to action. So this is this is really important. And at the end, as we said earlier, a few of us, you know, selling something that people have got to have today. In which case, tomorrow will do. And as we know, tomorrow doesn't always come. So what you can do is try and create a level of urgency. Again, that's not that difficult to do in a small company. You know, creating urgency if you're BT.
So I think Neil's um, internet might be having a bit of a moment. Um, so we'll just wait while he comes back on. So while we wait, I will um, read out some of the introductions that we had. Um, We're oh, back in the room. Neil, you're back. Perfect. I will shut up and back over to you. Well, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, our internet is uh, can be great, but then just suddenly drops out and drives you nuts. Uh, so call to action, really important. Multiple ways to contact uh, and just try and create some urgency and, and a feeling of urgency. So they're the eight business boosters. There's a workbook on every one of these. Uh, so they're all uh, there to, to use. So they'll, they'll show you how to do them, how to create them and everything else. And this ultimately is what we're talking about here is, is a mindset. And the way I like to think of it is that uh, you're in the dock. Uh, this is, this, and this is, this is so uh, easy to grasp in terms of the, the, the concept. So you're in the dock, you're, you're growing your business. Your business is on trial. You're being tried every single day. Uh, there's a jury to decide your future. Nice looking bunch of people there. Uh, and actually, but it gets more it gets more interesting than that because actually, there's two people. There's two juries because you've got prospects who are deciding whether to use you, but you've also got customers deciding whether to stay with you. And the stats on this are quite illuminating. Uh, in various surveys they're all broadly the same around 69 percent 68 percent of your existing customers stop using you because you show no interest in them they drift away because you need to you know the, the, the mindset is that your customers are your competitors prospects so you have no god-given right to a client or a customer and somebody else is because you know, if you do this business multipliers we talked at the beginning if people are spending all their time trying to attract new people and not looking after their existing ones existing people just drift away um, so what you've got to be thinking of is well if you're in the dock you need to present all the evidence to make sure that it, there is no question that you're the right person to deal with and the way i think of this is if you are giving a, a information to a barrister or a barrister and you know you're, you're good etc would you give your barrister just a little bit of information that i think i think this is enough to convince the jury to to say that i'm the right person here i think it is you know it should be there or thereabouts or do you give them all the information you possibly can so you smash it out of water so there is no possible chance that they make a mistake that's the certainly the logical bit to do and again you see this quite often in businesses that uh, i work with is, is they differentiate between small inquiries and big inquiries. So what seems like a small inquiry or something that's really a little bit small, I'm not sure I'm really interested. Actually, if you look after them, can morph into really big inquiries because it's this debate that sometimes we have in terms of, do you ask people's budget up front? And of course, sometimes people do and sometimes they don't. And I understand both sides. If you ask somebody the budget up front, actually the cynic in me would say, if I was asked that up front, I'm not going to tell you uh, what my budget is. Because if I say my budget's 10 grand for argument's sake, what's the chances your solution will be 9,997 quid? Whereas the smarter answer is, to, the smarter question is to know what my pain point is and what price would I pay to solve that pain point? Or alternatively, is it something that's going to generate me money, in which case what return on investment do I get? So I think you need to be treating every single inquiry as if it's the most important inquiry you've ever had. And if you do that via process, it's not that difficult to do. So you've got to present all your evidence every single time and make no mistake about that. And then if you get the processes right, it's relatively easy to do. Other things we talk about here within the Growth Club, and again, we've got a, a, a workbook workbook on is Moments of Truth. Moments of Truth was a book, I think, originally by uh, Jan Carlson, who was uh, the new CEO of Scandinavian Airlines. Uh, and he looked at what are the touch points within your business? Because in particular in a digital world, how often do you really engage with your clients or customers? You know, And 
quite often what you find is, you know, it can be in, in a physical business, the, the receptionist. Receptionist historically, probably the most poorly paid person in the room. Uh, and yet, actually, they're the ones who give the first impression of me. And we probably all come across brilliant receptionists who do really well and worth their weight in gold. They recognize your voice, they re remember you, they know you're turning up and greet you by name. Uh, they're efficient. And that can be same with people who answer the phone or the email inquiry. These are the touch points. Uh, and, and the trick is to empower people uh, to care. And the moments of truth, from my perspective, can often be uh, phone numbers. How easy is it to speak to your bank? I needed to get in touch with Virgin Money uh, my, uh, on my mum's estate. Uh, my mum passed away last month, so I'm just dealing with her estate. Had some money with Virgin Money. You can't find a phone number from. And actually nothing on their website talks about their bereavement team. Uh, every other bank does. And you just think, that's just moronic. Uh, and, well, that sums up the company to a large extent. But you just think... It just annoys you. That's the moment of truth. So is that the thing I remember? And actually, that's the thing that really sticks in my mind. The other one is Waymish. Uh, and what, what I mean by Waymish is why are you making it so hard? You know, can people contact you easily? Because it's very easy to point a finger at other people. But actually, you know, whenever you point a finger, there's three pointing back at you. And so can people contact us easily? When you're doing online forms and stuff, do you really need all these mandatory sections? Because oh, you know we know the stats. When people, the more mandatory sections, the more people think you know. You know what? I'm not going to. Actually, I won't bother. Uh, I've seen this in the recruitment ad, the, the recruiting that I was doing so for somebody helping them do some recruiting. They were struggling with recruiting, and indeed, though, all the stats would say at the moment there's some really you know the numbers are up in terms of people recruiting, finding people is always been difficult but it's getting harder than ever and so we were talking about sending cvs and they got to answer this that and the other and actually we changed all of it and just said just ring this mobile number if you just want to chat i don't need a cv ultimately we will but actually cvs are you know i would argue pretty waste of time i just want to chat to you so if you and we changed the recruitment advert to say just text or ring tell us when is a good time to call and we'll have somebody senior in the firm actually ring you and it actually worked. We had some really good candidates recruited four people on the back of that campaign, whereas we've been struggling to get into it because we just wanted to talk. Uh, and that's indeed for most of us, isn't it? So, you know, make it easy. Buyer's remorse we touched on before. Uh, we all suffer from it. Uh, and the bigger the ticket, the bigger the remorse. So a sale isn't made until the money's changed hands and the returns period is gone or whatever. So buyer's remorse is, you know, you need to be conscious of it. Uh, and we do a whole workbook on this. And what you can do is a bit like the trouser company. You know, they just re-emphasize, you got 200 days, so don't worry about it. Just try them, see what you think. We, 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 you know, if there's something wrong, send it back. If you don't like them, send it back. So for they're, they're, this is this unspoken bit. And buyer's remorse is something we all suffer from. It's unspoken, but get it out there in the open. So we know you're going to think about it. So, you know, this is what we do about it. Keep in touch with the moving parade. And this is keeping in touch with uh, prospects. You know, you don't want to nag, but you do want to offer uh, information. You never know when people are going to buy. Uh, and you could try this as an exercise. Most firms are lousy at this. Like, needed a new printer not that long ago, contacted numerous number of printing companies uh, online just to uh, get some information, uh, and uh, not a, sing a single one of them followed up, not a single one. In the B2B world, the number of touch points depends on which survey you read, but it's seven to 10 to 12 touch points before people buy. Most people, most salespeople give up after one or two because we don't like rejection. And actually, we're busy dealing with other new leads rather than trying to convert the ones we've had all along. Uh, I have done a lot of mystery shopping exercises for people because it's always fascinating seeing what's going on with your competitors. There was a time when I was really worried about uh, leaving them phone numbers and stuff, thinking, well, I don't want to get pestered by these people. It's almost unheard of for any of them to ring you. So you read an inquiry, even if you speak to them on the phone, for them to follow up and say, we spoke last week, last month, etc. just wondered how you're getting on, almost never happens. So 
so people are busy, but they're busy doing entirely the wrong things. I would also be transparent on price. Uh, it saves everybody time. There's a great book, They Ask You Answer, uh, by Marcus Sheridan, which is a fantastic book on, on price. Uh, now, you can't always be specific, but you can give people a range. You can give case studies. And it just shows you've got nothing to hide. Uh, and if you give a range as well, then the reality is if somebody's, you know, the real cheapskate, then they're not going to bother. But the more you can tell people up front, the more you're demonstrating expertise. And if you think about this, if you go on a website in particular and there's no prices on anything, do you, you know, you've got two choices. You either think to yourself, well, this is a bespoke service here. Yeah, I understand why there's no prices and maybe I'll engage with them and speak to a salesperson. Or do you think, as I tend to, that well, what are they hiding? Is it going to be silly money? And actually, is it all going to be down to my negotiating skills? Well, you know, that's why we don't like buying cars, because we hate that process. So you think, actually, you know what? I'll find somebody else, because there's always somebody else. So that's a whistle-stop tour. And what we've actually got, and this is the bit that uh, I wanted to talk to you about, is we've got 19 modules, or I created 19 modules. Each module has a short video of me talking. Uh, then has a workbook that you can uh, will be sent to you in Word or you can use Google Docs, whichever you want. Uh, I've not padded anything out, so they're exactly to the point and uh, how you want them to be. They, they cost nothing to implement because this is all the use of words and they're free. So either there's no subscription or, or anything else. And what we have within the Growth Club is we do do monthly webinars uh, where we chat about different things and issues that tend to be an hour long. Got a numerous uh, number of podcasts, which are all on the system point of view, on the Chamber Knowledge Hub as well. And the podcasts are all business owners who've got something to say and something of interest. They Some of the podcasts are on slightly bizarre subjects. We've got some on Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, purely because it's a subject that interests me. And we've even got some on grief because a very good friend of mine lost his, uh, his wife for 50 odd years and is really struggling. But actually, it's it's just human beings, so it's just you know business owners and business people talking. So the podcasts are very really good. We help each other. In terms of my one-to-one -one work, I, I I have very limited availability for one-to-one -one work, so everything I tend to do is via the uh, Growth Club. And this is the uh, how you can find the Growth Club. This is the uh, website where you can go to, you register, uh, and you can get access to the workbook straight away. Uh, if you register. I don't spam you, I don't do any uh, email mailing or anything else because uh, I haven't got the time. The idea was to help local businesses because if we all help each other, actually, we'd all be better off. Mm -hmm. So that's my whistle stop tour, Kayleen. So, uh... Thank you so much. Um, I've popped in the chat, and again, if you've got any questions for Neil following his incredible presentation, then please pop them in the Q&A function or if you want to put them in the chat, it's absolutely fine. So one question that I had is, um, do the principles um, that we have been discussing apply to service sectors? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. It, it does, and it applies to the physical side as well as uh, whether you're a purely digital business. The principles are exactly the same. And as I've mentioned at the beginning this, none of this is unique and new and, and anything else these are principles that have, in some cases go back decades that people have been you know really great salespeople, great businesses have been built on these principles uh, some of the early advertising people uh, have been built on these principles uh, so uh, yeah definitely works in the service sector or manufacturing or whether you're in the trades uh, it doesn't really matter. The principles are exactly the same. Perfect. Thank you so much. Also, there might be some people trying to frantically type, which is fine. If you want to just let me know in the chat function, because I'd hate to close the webinar off early if you are, or if you want to verbally ask your question, then just virtually raise your hand or again, just mention in the chat and I can give you permission to do so. So, while we wait a minute or so to see if any other questions come in, Neil, is there any other words of wisdom that you want to part on um, this webinar this morning? Blimey. Uh, That's putting I, you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. I think 
what I, what I, I guess the history of the Growth Club is, uh, I came up with this idea and concept of trying to do stuff online. What the evidence would say that most people struggle with online learning. Uh, it's one of those things we mean to do and never quite get around to and never quite find the time. And, and that's why anybody in, in my mind who's got an open university degree or whatever is, you know, has really earned that degree well and truly. <laughs> Uh, and take my hat off to them. So what we've tried to do is these are these are very short and sharp workbooks. These aren't uh, going to take you hours to do. These are things that will just challenge you, make you think, that will enable you to say, well, actually, if I just made a tweak here, and how does that work? And what do I do with this bit? So the, the workbooks themselves you don't have to do in order either. I mean, there's there's 19 of them. It's quite difficult to know what the right order is in business because we're all in different stages. You might be a relatively new startup. You might be an established one. You might be a family business. Who knows? So what we find is people dip into them and say, actually, that's that, that seems to be something that resonates with me and that helps. And also it helps sometimes if you're dealing with other professionals. So if you're dealing with a marketing agency or somebody who's writing your copy or a website design, uh, website company. Actually, it helps to have these principles because then you know what to be asking them to do for you rather than just getting something that looks pretty. That's the trouble with websites. They look pretty, but actually, so what? Every website looks pretty. You know, we've all got themes and templates we can buy, but actually, is it doing what you want it to do? Is it worth the money and the time and the effort and everything else? Perfect. I can find that sometimes with people being so busy, they can neglect the importance of their website. Um, I know one of our members recently came to the Chamber Connect and met um, another member that specialises in it. And from that, they made a connection and he's now updating his website. But even though someone has an incredible website, it doesn't mean that they're good at what they do. Sometimes the ones that look horrendous and you think, oh my God, they are great, but they just don't have time or don't realise the importance that actually your website is effectively your shop window, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think that's an interesting point because sometimes you, I think as a small business, you can say, look, I, you know, we're a small business, so we're, we're, we're tackling the bits that really matter with our customers and our clients. And we may not be very slick at things, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't care. We don't want to get it right. But I think sometimes being brutally honest to say that we're really small, we haven't got a team of receptionists and a team of people handling this stuff. You know, you'll deal with Kayleen, who's you know our director in charge of this, and she'll be back to you shortly, but give us a break. Uh, and I think you can get away with that as a small business. Uh, and and because you most of the time, if you think of a lot of the bigger businesses you deal with, they have salespeople, and once the sale's done, then they lose interest. They just pass you on to somebody else. And I thought I was dealing with you, and now I'm dealing with somebody else, and they're not returning my call, and it isn't quite right, and the product's not quite right. I think as a small business, you can get around all that problem, say, well, there's, there's, we're a small team, so we're all doing different jobs, so you know, we'll get back to you today. Definitely. Right, we've got some questions coming in. So Alison Wheeler says, just wondering, when marketing, do you think social media is the way forward or can we use old fashioned leaflets slash advertising in magazines? It's a good question, Alison. The social media, of course, is uh, I'm, I'm somewhat biased in the sense of uh, I don't particularly like it. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, it's just noise. Uh, but some people make it work very well. Uh, but generally speaking, I think given the choice, uh, old-fashioned marketing and leaflets uh, and direct mail you know when did when was the last time somebody sent you did some direct mail properly addressed in a handwritten envelope uh, with a stamp on it rather than uh, uh, something else it really, you'd open it because if the whole purpose is to get you to look at stuff the problem with social media and LinkedIn and we all use LinkedIn but the problems with all those formats is They've all got algorithms. They're all trying to flog stuff. Uh, never mind the people are trying to flog stuff. So I think old-fashioned advertising has a... I'm sure there's a, a real market for old-fashioned direct mail. Brochures are difficult. 
because what happens with brochures is quite often what I see is people put everything into a brochure. So everything I possibly do, I put in a brochure. What happens with that is that you end up not talking to your target market. And you don't want to be a generalist. Uh, there's no point being a generalist. What you need to be is, is a niche player where you're an expert in these fields. And that's all I do is an expert in those fields. So I would, I'm, I'm far from convinced on social media. I would do old fashioned advertising or old fashioned marketing. Thank you. We've got a question from Ross from GD Limited. What are your thoughts on how to strike the balance between encouraging existing customers to think about purchasing more and appearing to badger them when they've completed their one-time sale and may want to be left alone now? It's a good question. Uh, and you see that sometimes with, uh, in all sorts of ways, don't you? With Amazon in particular, where people immediately ask you to leave a review and you're thinking, well, I haven't even tried the product yet. And it arrived a couple of days ago. But they're partly doing that because that's their only way of getting in touch with you. Uh, and I do think you need to be very mindful and cautious. Uh, and if it's a typical one-time product, then maybe it isn't worth badgering them. But for most people, then it's a question of, saying to them you know what did you like what did you dislike uh, let me just tell you some other news uh, that's going on different products and services different case studies that thought might be interesting to you so you're not badgering them you know do you want to buy something else and i also think the the contact needs to be relevant i don't see a lot of points saying we've had a new joiner you know let me tell you about our new offices and by the way i've got a new car or who cares but case studies can be really important. I had a few more testimonials thought you might be interested in seeing. You know, we're entering the summer months, so this might be relevant to you. But it, it, you do, it do need a strategy with it rather than just badgering people, because otherwise they'll just unsubscribe and, and then they're gone. Perfect. So I think that's everything with three minutes to spare. I also have included in the chat a copy to the feedback link. It only takes a couple of minutes. We would really appreciate it just to get your feedback on what you thought about the session. If there's anything else you would like us to do. I'm saying this, but another question has come in, so we won't miss it. So hi, Jamie from Arena Partnerships. In the current conditions with people working from home a lot more, what is the best way to get to the prospect contact, telephone call or email, knowing that even the receptionist is working from home? That's a good question, Jamie. Uh, I, I personally would uh, pick up the phone. Uh, I think it's easier because often the, the things aren't going by a receptionist or a uh, a telephonist at the moment, it's probably easier to get in front of people now than it's ever been. So I personally would pick up the phone. Uh, or if you're able to find a mobile number, send them a text message, because people read text messages uh, without show of a day. Email, you've always got the danger that it's spam. You've no idea if they've read it or not. Uh, and even if you do, I guess like most of us, we get so many emails in the course of the day. Even if I'm interested in it, the chances of me responding are slim because you know, something else will happen that is more interesting, more relevant, more important, more urgent. So I would try largely at the moment to do uh, telephone because I think you stand a good chance of getting in front of people. And I've seen that in terms of my own work uh, and also talking to some partners of some quite big firms where they've decided they don't need so many receptionists anymore. They don't need people fielding the calls in quite the same way. Uh, and I think people have got used to you know, answering the phone now. So, but people don't tend to ring, do they? Uh, I don't, you know, people hide behind emails. So I look busy, I've sent 30 emails. Actually, the fact that 29 of them didn't get read and one of them did get read, but they won't get actioned. Uh, but actually I've been busy, but that's not the point. So I, Jamie, I would pick up the phone. Thank you so much. So yeah, now I think we've answered all of your questions, but um, if there's anything that you think of later on, I'm sure Neil will be happy for you to contact and reach out to him. Um, I was going to say via social media, but I'm not sure how well that would go down. <laughs> email is best, uh, or via the website, via email. 
Perfect. I'll include the link in the post event email. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope you found it as useful as I have. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and week. Um, thank you um, to, I know we've got some um, people joining us on the webinar who have got an exhibition stand at the B2B. So we look forward to meeting people face to face at B2B. We've also launched last week Talking Tech as well. So again, I'll include some information in there in the post event email. And yeah, we cannot wait to see people face to face, fingers crossed in the very near future. So yeah. Neil, did you want to say a final farewell before we go? Yeah, well, thanks, thanks everybody for. I uh, hope you found it useful. Uh, I, I always go to the B to B event. We've got to stand there because it's great. You know, it's a great day, isn't it? I just love that. And it's great. And the the Norfolk Showground is a is a much better venue than it used to be because uh, there's easy parking, loads of space, and loads of room. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing people there. Yep, you can dance around the aisles if you really want. We've got that much space now. And as Neil said, you can also visit his stand as well. I'll, do you want me to include what stand number you're on in your post event email as well? If you if you could know, find out what it is, Kayleen, that'd be of great. Of course I can, it won't I take you that remember. long. Yeah, okay. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll send the um, follow up email shortly along with the recording um, later on this week. So yeah, enjoy your week day and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye everyone. Bye.